everyone. It's good to see you all today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we are in our study of uh, or, uh, Samuel Kings and Chronicles. If you've been with us for the past number of weeks and you know we've been in the book of Micah and uh, we're going to finish our time in the book of Micah this morning. And so we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of, pr to, in a word of prayer and then we'll jump in. Father, we're thankful for who you are. Lord, you are a great God, and it is a privilege that we have to be able to gather together this morning as your church in, uh, in Austin, Texas, to come to know and study you and consider the things of you. Father, we do pray and ask that you would bless our time of study, and Lord, I do pray you would bless the time of study and uh, other local churches in Austin as they seek to come to know you this morning through your word. Lord, I pray that you would um, that you would confront wrong ways of thinking that we have, even through this text, uh, that you would establish us rightly, and that we'd be renewed in the spirit of our minds uh, by the working of your spirit in concert with your word. Father, we're thankful for this study in Micah, or at least I'm thankful for it, thankful for uh, the reminders of who you are and being our just God. And uh, Father, I pray that we would live more like you because of our study in this passage this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I just mentioned, we'll be concluding our study of Micah this morning, and our, our, our text actually ends with one of the most, I think it's one of the most beautiful lines that you find in all of the Bible. And I want to open with that this morning, that line. And so if you do have your Bible, uh, if you want to join me in Micah uh, chapter 7, we'll, be, we'll study in chapter 6 through 7 today. But uh, I want to begin in chapter 7. I'm going to read uh, verses 18 and 19 before we consider the rest of our text. And as you're turning there, um, I, I want to pose a question for you. It's a question you've surely considered before, and it's one that uh, we've probably considered while we're together at some point or another uh, as well, and at least in the past. And the question is this, what is our greatest need? Maybe put more directly, what is your greatest need? The way you live your life demonstrates what you believe about what your greatest need is. Uh, many people, if you look at the world, just at the landscape, they have decided that money is their greatest need, and therefore their life is built around the pursuit of riches and wealth. Uh, famously, uh, as many of you know, J.D. Rockefeller, uh, the richest man in the world in his day, uh, he famously once said, he was, or he was asked this, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And Rockefeller responded, just one more dollar. And so just showing the, the insatiable desire that he had for money, the, the all-consuming desire, having the most money in the world, that wasn't enough. Um, I, I didn't look it up, but with the amount of money he had in that day, probably more money than some smaller nations in one man. Some live their lives seeking to acquire money. They think that that's the greatest need that they have, just filling their life with dollars. Uh, some find their uh, need very similarly in possessions. Uh, I learned that Jay Leno has over 300 automobiles. Almost one for every day of the year. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, CEO of Amazon, has nine homes. In some ways, I was surprised it wasn't more, but uh, I understand those are extremes. For others, their treasure is much smaller. It's much more simple what they view their greatest need to be. It could be a writing utensil for people in some parts of the world. Others have determined their greatest need is to live forever. So in line with that, individuals eating a very particular diet, exercising multiple nights a week, never missing eight hours of sleep. Their life is built around living as long as they can. There are many who believe their greatest need is the approval of others. So throughout their life, they're just constantly seeking to, to appeal to others and pleasing others. They never want conflict their highest aim is that no one would ever look down on them because really their greatest need is, is, is prideful, it's comfort. I can't have anyone think ill of me. Because of that, these individuals, these same ones, will often cut corners in ethical matters to achieve their desired ends. It's a sampling. But do any of those proposed solutions solve the problem to what our greatest need is? Do any of them even touch on what our greatest need is. 
And uh, the answer is no. And uh, we find out what our greatest need is in Micah, again, chapter 7, verses 18 through 19. It's a summary of our greatest need and the inestimable kindness of our God. Micah says as follows, Who is a God like you who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold fast to his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And you, referring to the Lord, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I love that. It's just like, oh, just such a wonderful verse. Our greatest need is salvation. Our greatest need is to be made right with the holy God because we have sinned against him. We tread down God's name and his character when we sin. And we can't simply cast our own sins away into the depths of the sea. We can't just declare that and it be a reality. Because God is omniscient. God knows all things, including our thoughts, the motives of our actions. Even our secret sins are in the light of your presence. He knows everything, everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done. While we may forget our sins, he does not. And he's omnipresent. He's the one who fills time and space. He's been there for every sin that you've ever committed, every sin that I've ever committed. The one who knows all things, who never forgets, the one who is in all places, filling all space, is the one who, and the only one who, can choose to look past our sins. But it's not looking past in as much as they're just still very real sins that stand against us and testify against us, and he's pretending that they aren't there. Of course, we know the reason he's able to look past or cast our sins into the depths of the sea is because our sins have actually been paid for fully and finally in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we can have a statement like this one. It's because from Micah's vantage point, the Messiah is coming. God will make all things right. And we know the way that he does that is through his son. He is the only one the Lord is who can purge us from our sin. He is the only one who can save us and reconcile us to himself. He is the only one who can cast our sins into the depths of the sea. And that is great news. That is great news because it shows forth the kindness of our God. The last thing that we deserve is salvation. I mean, there's a reason that Paul multiple times describes salvation as a gift. It's a gift. It's not deserved. It can't be earned. (laughs) It's the best gift of all. And the people in Micah's day, they didn't deserve that gift. Now, if you've been with us in our study, you know that. We've seen that together. Judah was utterly corrupt. She's known for her injustice. So was Israel. Like was writing at a time before, uh, a time uh, before, both before and after Israel was taken into exile in 722 BC. But um, we see both of them mentioned here. Of course, the focal point is on Judah. The kings of Judah are listed at the beginning of the book. But um, In order for us to understand and see Judah's character, to realize that she's crooked and that she's not straight, is because of the standard, our just God, our perfect God. And I know when we were starting our study, I said that this is, Micah is really a book about the social injustice of Judah. If I were to change that, I'd probably say that it's about the justice of our God, because I think that's what stands out and that's what that really shines forth throughout this, the entirety of this book. God is just, and therefore he expects justice from his people, and that's exactly what he wasn't getting from them. In spite of God setting them apart, in spite of God delivering his word to them, in spite of God uh, uh, um, uh, bringing the covenants to them, them being his covenant people, in spite of setting them apart, doing all of these things, in spite of delivering them time and time again, even when they didn't deserve it, they still continued to live against God and to live against one another. They, they reversed the greatest commands in loving God and loving one's neighbor. Back in Micah 1, 2 through 5, verses you're 
probably familiar with by now, and that's good, but this really is showing us the heart of these people and what's wrong. Hear, O peoples, all of you, give heed, O earth, as well as its fullness, and let Lord Yahweh be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, Yahweh is going forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. All this for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So, I mean, right there, you see Jerusalem, the high place of Judah, high places where idolatry took place. The Lord's going to come forth and tread on the high places of the earth. We see Samaria highlighted as well with her sins against the Lord. Israel, on the whole, Israel and Judah, they were known for idolatry. And of course, if I mean, this is something they would have known that's wrong. Like this isn't hard, difficult to miss. It's I mean, if you think of the Ten Commandments, how they begin. I mean, this is something that everyone in Israel would know, or at least should know. Exodus 20 verses 1 through 6. Then God spoke these words, saying, "I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me." You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." I mean, it doesn't get clearer than that. These people understood. They had, they, had, they had the law. They had the word. They understood that this was wrong. Their conscience would testify against them. But Israel, from the t- their time in Egypt and beyond, was known for that which God forbade. In Joshua 24, 14. And I know we considered this last week, just bringing us back up to speed. So now, Joshua says, fear Yahweh and serve him in integrity and truth and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. So Joshua, as the people had entered into the promised land, is telling them to stop doing what they've been doing. They can't continue it. I mean, when Moses was on Sinai and he came down and the the people pledged themselves to this covenant, they said, we will do these things. Then he comes down and they're made a golden calf and they're worshiping it. Both Samaria and Judah, for all intents and purposes, were like the nations around them. They were worshiping the works of craftsmen's hands. They were worshiping and serving the creature above the creator who's blessed forever. It is high-handed sin, idolatry. And it doesn't stop there, as it usually doesn't. If someone is worshiping something else other than the Lord, then there are going to be many different corrupted effects that occur in one's life. In Micah 2, 1 through 5, woe to those who devise wickedness, who work out evil on their beds. When the light of morning comes, then they do it, for it's in the power of their hands. And they covet fields and tear them away, and houses and take them away. And they oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, behold, I am devising against this family an evil demise from which you cannot remove your necks. You will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. On that day they will take up against you a taunt and utter a bitter wailing and say, We are completely devastated. He exchanges the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To the faithless one he apportions our fields. Therefore you will have no one stretching a measuring line for you by lot in the assembly of Yahweh. So again, we see it's not just sin against, it's sin against God through idolatry. It's sin against God even through not loving one's neighbor. It's injustice. It's injustice that's rampant, social injustice. People are extremely selfish. They're thinking about evil in their beds before they go to bed at night. They wake up in the morning and they do what they're dwelling on. They're not meditating on the Lord. They're meditating upon themselves. They're meditating upon um, evil. And so they're supposed to be 
again, this is Israel. She's supposed to be a light that draws the nations to the Lord. She's supposed to have an attractive effect. The, people, the nations were to see Israel being set apart. The blessing that comes from God, the beauty of the Lord through her devotion and her piety. And that was meant to be attractive to the nations. I mean, we see an element of that in 1 Kings 8 through 10, where the nations are attracted. The Queen of Sheba comes all the way from uh, Ethiopia or possibly Oman or Yemen, depending on uh, you know, where you map that. I think probably around Ethiopia. But she's traveling all this way to glean from the wisdom of Solomon. You have the nations coming and bringing their best to the land. It's a, it's a wonderful scene. And that's really the only snapshot that we have of Israel living uh, in the way that she was called to for that, that, that moment in time, that sliver of time. And we have, we have other moments to be clear. Hezekiah, we just saw that. We'll see it in Josiah, Lord willing, in a few weeks or maybe a few months. But um, Israel on the whole, though, they weren't living like that. They weren't, they weren't showing the beauty of the Lord through how they lived. No, they were living just like the nations on the whole. They were stealing, they're coveting. They're, 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 they're just, they're hurting others, taking advantage of others. Someone comes home from war, we read in Micah 2, and they're trying to steal the coat off their back after they've been fighting to protect the people. I mean, that's just how corrupt things are. It's, 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 it's yeah, it's, it's chaos. And then that's not even to mention how the people are seeking to silence Micah. They're mocking Micah. They're telling him to be quiet, and he's God's prophet. What's that saying? We don't want to hear from the Lord. I mean, it's just... I, yeah, could probably say more, but I mean, you, you, you see what's going on. And that builds into Micah 3, 9 through 11. Um, well, I guess I will mention this too. Um, uh, so now hear this, heads of house of Jacob and heads and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice. So these are the leaders who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her heads pronounce judgment for a bribe, and her priests instruct for a price, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on Yahweh, saying, Is not Yahweh in our midst? Evil will not come upon us. Twisting everything that's straight. I mean, I think we talked about it before, but, you know, um, Yahweh's in our midst. Evil will not come upon us. That's exactly what the people thought when they, with the Ark of the Covenant, right? They're like, we have the Ark of the Covenant. They treated it like a talisman. And they thought, you know, hey, if we have this with us, there's no way we'll ever be destroyed. And then what does God do? He gives it over to the Philistines. Like the te- I don't think you see that in Samuel, uh, but uh, you can appeal to another text. I just can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But God gives the Ark of the Covenant over. It's not that the, that the Philistines are oh so powerful. It's no, Israel was oh so evil in that moment that he gave the covenant over. I mean, even in the book of Deuteronomy, I was just reading it this week and I was reminded of it. But yeah, when... Um, uh, when Moses is talking to the people, he said, he, this is the Henry paraphrase. I don't know where it is off the top of my head, uh, but um, effectively, it is not because you're so righteous that God is delivering you, but it's because the nations are so evil. And so just sort of having that paradigm and perspective there. And, um, um, but I mean, the same thing would happen even with uh, the temple. You know, we have, I mean, this is sort of the idea, like God is in the, our midst in the temple. We have the Lord and yet he will remove his presence, his manifest presence from the temple in Ezekiel. But anyway, I think we're at least all in the same spot where we can see there is clearly a case against Judah and Israel. Both of them have been walking in sin. Both have stand guilty before the Lord. They have been unjust. But in spite of that, what we get reminders of throughout this text is that God's character hasn't changed. While Israel is changing and they'll be devoted to the Lord in one moment and then they'll waver in their devotion for some time, God does not change. And in Micah 2, 12 through 13, we're reminded of this, that he won't go against his word or the covenants of his promise. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the flock, like a fold in the midst of its pasture. They will be with the noisy men. The noisy men they will be noisy with men. The brave Breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes before them, and Yahweh at their head. And that's just incredible right there. And that's the Lord's kindness, because they don't deserve that at all. In the same way that we don't deserve our salvation at all. We don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's something that we can't earn. And God is showing his immeasurable grace towards these people. And this is just like a... Uh, story of the Bible. 
And it's stunning, the grace on display, and it just shows who our God is. God will save a remnant. God will save his people. God will be faithful to who he is every single time. And we expect that because we know who our God is. And, and God speaking to Moses and describing who he is in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, we read, Then Yahweh passed in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh, God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he'll by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God is compassionate. God is gracious. He's forgiving. And we see that in Micah 2, 12 through 13. And he's just. And he is a judge for those who perpetually reject him. And we see that at the end of verse 7 in uh, Exodus 34. God shows us in this book in Micah that a remnant will turn to him. Micah 4, 1 through 3, now it'll be in the last days. The mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the head of the mountains and will be lifted up above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh into the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us from his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples. And he will render decisions for mighty distant nations, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Again, we're getting a, a, just sort of a further view into Micah 2, 12 through 13. There's going to be a time that's described further here where there won't be war. People in the world are streaming to learn from the Lord. That attractive element that we talked about earlier is there. And it's all tied as we get into the next chapter to Micah 5 2. But as, to, as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from everlasting, from the ancient, day, of, from the, the ancient days. How is this possible? Israel in sin to Israel transformed in ruling. Nations coming to learn of the Lord, it's all tied to the arrival of this one here, the eternal one robed in flesh, Jesus, who would come. And uh, this is God making a statement very clearly here. Again, this is about 700 years before Jesus would be born, a little over 700 years. And God is saying that, that he's calling his shots. He's going to act. The seed of the woman will arrive. God has not forgotten his plan. He's going to bring it about. But before that would happen, there are other prophecies that need to be fulfilled. Now, I won't read this due to time. If you want to look into Leviticus 26, the very end of it, it describes the land making up its Sabbaths. Because of the sin of the people in Micah's day, particularly those of Judah, they would go into exile. Like her big sister went into exile, Israel into Assyria, uh, Judah would go into exile in Babylon because they'd been unfaithful. I will read Deuteronomy 28, 49. Yahweh will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth. And so that being the idea, there is a nation that is going to come and judge them. And that's because under the Mosaic Covenant, they had been living in perpetual unfaithfulness. They hadn't been listening to the Lord. Jeremiah 25, 8 through 11, we read, Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, because you've not listened to my words, behold, I will send and take all your all the families of the north, declares Yahweh, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all its surrounding nations. And I will devote them to destruction and make them an object of horror of, and of hissing in an everlasting waste place. Moreover, I will make the voice of joy in the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of the millstones and the light of the lamp to perish from them. This whole land will be a waste place and an object of horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And so the people of Micah, if they continue, well, we see that they will continue in sin, and while there will be moments where people will be more faithful to the Lord, again, Hezekiah and Josiah being examples of that, uh, Israel will not, or Judah will not turn away from her sin. She will go into exile, and that does take place historically. The land would be emptied uh, to make up its uh, 70 Sabbath years that had been skipped. It was going to happen. 
Um, and so what that means for us at present, given sort of what we've seen and what we're building upon um, even the last couple of weeks in our study, is even though one day Judah would be restored, one day Judah would be believing, at present they were not. At present, these people were living for sin, and they remained in sin. And so with that being said, we'll pick up where we left off last time. We finished in verse 8 of Micah 6, or, my, or verse 8 of Micah chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 9, and we'll go ahead and read. The voice of Yahweh will call to the city, and it sound wisdom to fear your name. Oh, excuse me, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear, O tribe, who even has appointed its time? Is there yet a man in the wicked house along with the treasures of wickedness in a short measure which is cursed? Can I purify wicked scales in a bag of deceptive weights? For the rich men of the city are full of violence and her inhabitants speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So also I will make you sick, striking you down, desolating you because of your sins. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied and your vileness will be in your midst. And you will try to remove something for safekeeping, but you will, not, you will not cause anything to escape. And that which you do have, and that which you do have escape, I will give to the sword. You will sow, but you will not reap. You will tread the olive, but will not anoint yourself with oil. And the grapes, but you will not drink wine. The statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab are kept. And in their counsels you walk. Therefore, I will give you as an object of horror... And your inhabitants is an object of hissing, and you will bear the reproach of my people. Now, last week, if you were with us, God was calling people. We saw this, this plea for them to live as he'd made them to in verses 6 through 8. With that, with what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself before the God on high? This is Micah speaking. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with yearling, ca- with yearling calves? Is Yahweh pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, the Lord has, O man, what is good. And what does Yahweh require of you but to do justice, to love loving kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? So God had been very clear with them about how they were to live with his call upon their lives, and this is what they weren't doing. It's not how they were living. These qualities didn't characterize them. And in verse 9, as we transition, uh, we, we see basically this call to listen up. The people need to hear what Yahweh says. They need to uh, walk in wisdom and apply what they know to be true. They need to live in light of the character of God, and that bridges us straight into this peel of who God is, and God is speaking here in, in verse uh, 9, and then we'll, uh, beginning in verse 9, but we see that God is the one who had set apart this house. God is the one who had set them apart. God is the one who had, um, God is the one who's over them. He's greater than them. He's the one who controls the times and the seasons. He's showing forth his power and his control, who's even appointed its time. They need to bend to him. They need to listen to him. They need to submit to him. And then God provides further description of the corruption of the people. There's wickedness in the wicked house. It just shows the, 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 the is, is there a man in the wicked house along with the treasures of, 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 of wickedness? This is a wicked house. There are wicked people that are there, there's treasures of wickedness that have been procured through evil deeds. They were thieves. They'd been taking advantage of their neighbors. They're unlike God. They're unlike the Lord. And God, as we spoke about earlier this morning, while we get to the verse where he casts their sin into the depths of the sea, and he will probably look past may not be the best way to say it, but... um, God can't simply, and I'm going to use that phrase here, he can't simply look past or, or, or purify unjust or like wicked scales. We see that in the text. He can't do that precisely because he's holy. Like they have no problem with that. They wouldn't because they're corrupt, but he does. Leviticus 26, 35 through 37, we read, You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measurement of weight or in volume. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah. And adjust him. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall thus keep my statutes, all my statutes, and all my judgments, and do them. I am Yahweh. So again, it, God had spoken to this. 
been very clear with them, and yet they were seeking to not live in light of that. God won't honor deceptive weights, and we see very clearly based on this text as we uh, continue on in verse 11 and following that if they, if they don't repent, if they don't turn away, they're going to be judged. God isn't so unjust to sweep sin under the rug or pretend that it isn't there. It needs, it will be punished precisely because God is righteous. And, and if they don't trust him, that, that, that they shouldn't be surprised. They shouldn't be at all surprised, especially those who know the word. And in verse 13, we see that the city is characterized uh, by violence, particularly among, among the rich. In verses, uh, verse 12 and 13, they're seeking to do harm to others that they might gain likely materially or socially in corrupted spheres. The city of Jerusalem is, is known for lies. Her inhabitants speak lies. In Zechariah 8.13, we read, Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. When will that happen? Before the Lord dwells there? No, it's when he dwells there. And the mountain of, the, of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Jerusalem has never been known perpetually as a city of truth. But it will be when Jesus reigns there. Again, we sort of spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, this, this movement and push toward we need to, you know, we're the ones to bring Jesus back and we need to Christianize the world and everything like that. Jerusalem will not be a city of truth until the Lord is there. When the Lord is there, then it will be called that. And, and I mean, even looking in the future from our vantage point, it won't be the city of truth anytime soon. During the tribulation period, it'll be referred to as Sodom and Egypt. It's not the city of truth, but one day it will be. It'll be glorious. Not there yet. Hosea 7.13, we read, Woe to them, for they have fled from me. Destruction is theirs, for they've transgressed against me, and I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. So not only are the inhabitants speaking lies to one another, they're speaking lies to God. They're lying to their maker. And God says in line with the Mosaic Covenant that judgment is coming. God will be true to his word. They'll, they'll, they'll be unsatisfied. They'll be unclean or vile. They'll not be able to hide or escape from this judgment. We see that very clearly. I mean, even in line with the Mosaic Covenant, I mean, sickness is part of that disease. If they're not faithful to the Lord, these are all things that God promised very clearly. And again, the design for these judgments and these curses is to remind people of the sovereign God who made them that they would look to him and not to themselves or not their, the nations or their idols for help, but they'd cry out to the living God, the God who hears. But as long as they remain unrepentant, they won't be able to escape this judgment. What they sow, they won't reap. We see that uh, the, 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 the blessings of the millennial kingdom with, with oil and with wine, like that's, that's not at all this time period. Not at all, it's judgment. And uh, they're, since they're not following God, we do find out who they are following in verse 16, the statutes of Omri in the works of the house of Ahab, two gentlemen that you don't want to be following. Because of that, they will be judged. Um, I'm just going to go through sort of a, a litany of verses here uh, from Deuteronomy 28. Um, these are covenant, covenant curses for disobedience to the second generation. You shall plant a vineyard, but you won't see its fruit. You'll build a house, but you'll not live in it. Uh, Yahweh will bring wondrous plagues on you. He'll bring on you all the diseases of Egypt, every sickness, every plague. That's verse 61. Let me see. Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, verse 64. Your life will hang in doubt before you. I mean, God, again, it's just, I just want to bring that before you just to say God had been clear with them. Here are all the expectations. If you're not faithful to your end of the covenant, this was what will happen. Shouldn't be surprising. God told them exactly what would happen. Some of you might look at these verses and say, wow, this seems harsh. This is really strong language. Like all these judgments, it's a whole lot. And if that's you, my encouragement to you would be that you would have God's view of sin, that you would have a high view of his character and his holiness. I'm not saying that you don't, but concerning sin, how vile it is, 
how wicked it is. These people had been living in sin perpetually. They had been walking in it. And they needed ice water on their face to wake them up. And so God would bring that and he would bring about judge, he would bring that toward them. Israel had corrupted themselves, they'd marred themselves. They were reproaching the Lord with how they were living. They weren't believing in him. It's interesting when you fast forward, when Jesus came on the scene, as you know, in John 7, his brothers weren't believing him. These Israelites, they weren't believing in Jesus. Word became flesh. But Jesus, when he came in his ministry, in spite of that, he was coming to testify against the world's evil. Verses 6 and 7 of John 7, So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I bear witness about it that its deeds are evil. The father, when, we, when we see a text like this one, the Lord is certainly not coddling these people in their sin. He's calling them to repent. That's the most loving thing that someone can do. And Jesus, in his ministry, he wasn't coddling people in their sin. He was calling them to repent. It's the most loving thing that he could do. When the text says Jesus was a friend of sinners, it doesn't mean that he enjoys their sin. He's a friend of sinners in that he was with the people and he was calling them to believe upon him. Again, that's the most loving thing that you can do. He wasn't coddling people in their sin. He says very clearly here, he bears witness against it, that its deeds are evil. But the good news is that he's come and he's made a way for sinners to be made right with him through his death and resurrection on the cross. Death and resurrection is raised from the dead, from the, t- from the tomb. Jesus didn't come to coddle them. He came to fulfill the law. He came to have sin for all of his people punished in himself, to be the substitute that we needed, to satisfy the wrath of the Father, to be judged in our place. The way that you get to sins being cast in the depths of the sea is through Jesus, and it's only through faith in him. And that's exactly what Israel needed to believe in. They needed to trust in and follow after and look toward the Messiah who Micah just said was coming. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, he just told them the child would be born. He was coming and they needed to look toward that and look toward the one who would make all things right and new, but they weren't doing that. And if you're here this morning and you're living in your sin, you need to do the same. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Look to the only one who can save you. Look to the only one who can forgive your sin and give you eternal life, and he will if you come to him, if you believe upon him. This judgment is extensive, and it continues in verse chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We read this, and this is really a response from Micah to what's been said, and it shows again just the, the sins among the people. Woe is me. For I am like a fruit, the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There's not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which my soul desires. The Holy One is perished from the land, and there is no upright person among men. All of them lie and wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the, one, hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a payment. And a great man speaks the craving of his soul, so they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchmen, your punishment will come. At that time, their panic will happen. Do not believe in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a close companion. From her who lies in your bosom, guard the openings of your mouth. For son treats father as a wicked fool, Daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own household. Micah cries out like Isaiah saying, woe is me. And that is the right response. He is an individual living among an unclean people. The landscape is barren. We see that there's no fruit. People are void of God on the whole. 
And if you think that the time that we're living in today is an island in history where most people reject God, you'd be wrong. That's the norm throughout history. And Micah is like Elijah. He's like a Micaiah, yet one man, testifying to the truth. We see the people excel in evil. Both hands do it well. The prince and the judge, those who are supposed to be righteous, those who are supposed to be operating in line with the truth, in line with reality, they're crooked. They pursue the flesh. The best person is like a thorn bush. Thorn bush is dangerous, easy to get hurt when one's around, and that's what people are like. But that wouldn't stop the Lord. We see that at the end of verse 4. God's watchmen, the prophets, they've warned time and time again that judgment's coming. And it would come. Well, they're living like it wouldn't. It would. That wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop God's plans and decrees from going forth. Sometimes we'll have people today that you know, think if I just pretend God doesn't exist or if I pretend that there's no hell... Uh, I, I, what, what is that? that? The John Lennon song, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. Is it no hell below us, above us, only sky? I think that's it. You can imagine all you want, but that doesn't change the truth that, that John Lennon's and others' consciences testify of. They know that God exists. Their conscience testifies that their sin is evil, that judgment is deserved. You can imagine all you want, but it will not stop God's plan from going forward. And that's the importance of these people repenting today and coming to the knowledge of the truth. They can live all they want like judgment isn't coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. It's foolish to ignore that warning. Ignore the warning from God's word. And you can see in verses 5 through 6, the destroyed relationships. People are lying all the time. They're untrustworthy. A man's enemies are those in his own household. I mean, ideally, if there are people you can trust, they're those in your household. Can't even do that in that day. It's pretty incredible. But Micah, he's not like that generation. Verses 7 through 8. But as for me, I watch expectantly for Yahweh. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not be glad over me, my, O oh my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I inhabit the darkness, Yahweh is a light for me. And that's, oh, it's just like, this is awesome. He's so unlike the generation he lived in. Others uh, around him love bloodshed. They love lying and maligning others. And he's like, I'm trying to live for you. Though everyone around me isn't. I'm seeking to be faithful to you. So my family, in the spite of his family possibly not living that way, given how we see that described, those in the marketplace not living that way, those around him working not living that way, there's a lot of application for you this morning in your workplace where God has placed you in your neighborhood where everyone makes a mockery of the Lord. Being someone like Micah who says, I'm living for you. My sight is fixed on you. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to speak for you. He knows, Micah does, that God remains true, that God remains faithful, that God will accomplish his purposes. His promises will come to pass. And even in moments when it seems as though evil will have the last say, Micah is confident, and we can be too, that it won't because God says that it doesn't. I think that when we look at the book of Micah, because we are going to finish it, uh, Lord willing, today, if we have enough time, Micah is just such a helpful book for us in the canon because we can look back at so many promises and words from the Lord that have come to pass. Israel is judged. We see the thoroughness of the judgments in line with the Mosaic Covenant, even as they go to Babylon. We see that they are restored temporally, they will be restored eternally for a remnant in the, in the future for those who trust in him. I'm sure there were a, a small a minority, certainly, that were saved coming out of the exile. I understand that. But we see a fulfillment in them coming back. We see the Lord Jesus Christ coming to the world. There's so much that we can look back on and we can say God was faithful to his word there. And it just encourages us and bolsters our faith to say God will be faithful here. God will be faithful in every regard 
Though the world changes, he does not. Micah's just like, he, I, 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 as for me, I watch expectantly for the Lord. Like Micah's so thankful he can come to the Lord in prayer. He knows that God hears him. He's trusting. No enemy of his should brag or taunt, verse 8, because, uh, uh, because even though, you know, they're being, pers- he and the other righteous people are being persecuted, they would rise. They would rise. They would be sustained by the Lord. In verses 9 through 13, I will bear the rage of Yahweh because I've sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and does justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. Then my enemy will see. And shame will cover her who said to me, where is Yahweh your God? My eyes will look on her. At the time she will be trampled down like mire of the streets. It will be a day for building your walls. On that day, your boundary will be extended. It will be a day when they will come to you from Assyria and in, in the cities of Egypt, from Egypt even to the river, even from sea to sea and mountain to mountain, and the earth will become desolate because of her inhabitants on account of the fruit of her deeds. So, so we see here at the beginning, maybe what we're not expecting after verses 7 and 8, but we see Micah acknowledging he's a sinner. And of course, we know that to be true. Everyone's a sinner. No, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But again, he's clinging to the Lord. Yahweh will deliver him. We see Micah will see his righteousness, and this speaks of the future, when he's vindicated, not because he's so great, but rather because he serves a great God who saves and delivers others, even like him. And the enemies of God, which included most of Israel at present, they'll be ashamed. Those who mocked Micah and the other prophets, the faithful, they'll realize their errors and judgment will be meted out. And we see that in the following verses. We see that um, uh, we see judgment will come um, in, yeah, my enemy will see in verse 11. We see a day for building walls, people will come, but we see that there will be judgment as well in verse 13, judgment for those who continue to reject the Lord. That brings us to the final verses in verses 14 through 20. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your inheritance, which dwells by itself in the forest, in the midst of a fruitful orchard. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the ancient days, as in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt. I will show you wondrous deeds. Nations will see and be ashamed of their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their deaf ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like crawling things of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortress. To Yahweh our God, they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. Who is a God like you who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? He doesn't hold fast to his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and loving kindness to Abraham, which you swore to our fathers from days, the days of old. So Micah cries out to the Lord to be their shepherd, their Psalm 23 shepherd, to lead them, to provide for them. Of course, we know that will happen uh, in a very physical, tangible fashion with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning over the people in the millennial kingdom. We see that he's appealing to provision as they'd had in the past in Bashan and Gilead, and the Lord responds in the affirmative that he will deliver and provide for his people. It is going to happen. In the future, we see the nations will be ashamed, those that uh, made a mockery of and looked down upon Israel. Someone was either really angry with what I just said, or that was a strong gust of wind. (laughs) Looks like some wind or something. Um, But those who opposed the Lord, they will be ashamed. They'll be judged like the serpent of Genesis chapter 3, they will be humiliated. They will acknowledge they're wrong. They'll confess it. And that brings us to where we began. Again, verses 18 uh, through 19, I think is what I read, but we'll read through verse 20. Again, I know I just read it, but who is a God like you who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? He doesn't hold fast to his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. 
You will give truth to Jacob and your loving kindness to Abraham, which you swore to our fathers from days of old. I know we've talked about it a lot because there are these just sort of little um, sort of like button hooks that, that Micah does where we come back and we're reminded of this. So the people are sinful and then we come up and we're reminded of what the future will look like. The people are in sin and then we come up and we're reminded of what the future will look like. Sort of holding the future before them as a motivator, as a great hope toward faithfulness, even though at present these people would be judged. Certainly for the righteous remnant, that would be an extreme encouragement. It's something even for those who are rebellious at present. Uh, to consider um, the beauty of righteousness, consider the beauty of living for the Lord. But as we come to these last few verses, I mean, this is a, 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 a picture in light of everything that we've seen in Micah of exactly what Israel and Judah don't deserve. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve forgiveness. They're consumed with idolatry, with social injustice, with all sorts of evil. Both hands do it well. From the top down, there's corruption but what is God going to do? We see he will bring about judgment for those who reject him. Won't forsake the word. He's going to do that. He's not going to forsake what he promised in, to, in the Mosaic Covenant. But we also see he's not going to be unfaithful to other promises that he's made. He's not going to be faithful or unfaithful to the covenant that he made with Abraham, covenant that he's made with David. Even the promises and the blessings that come in the Mosaic Covenant uh, toward the end of it, looking toward the restoration in Leviticus 26, God will be faithful to his word always. I mean, I, I know I, I may sound like a broken record, but I, I think this is one of the most beautiful love stories in all of the Bible, the story of God and Israel. Because as you go throughout Israel's formation, her creation being set apart, seeing how she has rejected him time and time again, but God will not reject her. He will not forsake the word of his promise. There will be a remnant who is saved and established that will live forever in glory with the Lord. And of course, we understand Israelites throughout history have been saved. God has called many people from the Jewish people unto himself. We live in the times of the Gentiles now, where mo mainly Gentiles are being saved, and it's to make Israel jealous, according to Paul in Romans 11. And uh, we know that God will turn his saving hand back toward Israel in the future, and we long for that. Israel doesn't deserve that, but God will be faithful. Israel will cry out cry out with all her heart truly and savingly blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord she will look upon the one that she's pure she will trust in the lord jesus christ she will repent of her sins and live with him forever and we rejoice in that we rejoice in that all of her sin will be cast into the depths of the sea for those who cry out to the lord jesus christ savingly and we know that there will be those who do that and we understand as well, you don't have to be ethnically Jewish to cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins to be forgiven. And we rejoice in that. Um, just a wonderful truth for us as believers um, on, a, on the whole here this morning to understand that the Lord has cast our sins into the sea, that they have actually been paid for, and that there is no debt of decrees that remains against us because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. So this is a small book, Micah, seven chapters. I think we spent maybe five weeks in it, uh, but it's a powerful book. I mean, this book just shines forth with the justice of God. God is just. Israel and Judah are not. One day they will be when they're restored. But this is a great book for us um, to look at, to consider, uh, even in the midst of the day in which we live in, where injustice is rampant. And as it was from the top down in Israel, it's the top down today as well. Uh, from the leaders in our society um, all the way down, there's corruption that's rampant. And we see many of the effect, effects of it today with laws that are passed and decisions that are made, uh, not just in a government sphere, but in business as well, unethical practices. I mean, it goes on and on. And this is a great reminder for us to make sure that we're aligning with God, that we're just like he is, that we look at things as he does, that we call a spade a spade, we call sin, sin, and that we seek to live faithfully for our Lord, all with the hope and knowing that one day these things will be restored when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns from the earth. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer, uh, and uh, then we'll be dismissed. Father, we're thankful for who you are, and that is such an understatement. Lord, we're thankful that you're just, 
We're thankful that you are perfectly righteous, that you are holy, 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 that there's no imperfection or blemish in you. And Father, when this world, uh, as this world is active with a mission uh, to corrupt our minds, to corrupt our thinking, to bring us down to their standard, that we would see things in their way. Father, we're so thankful for your word and the working of your spirit that, 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 that renew, who renews our minds, that we would see things rightly in line with your word and that we would live accordingly. Father, I pray that as you are just, that you would make us more of the just people that you d- desire us to be, that we would be people that think more and more biblically, that we would analyze uh, our culture and our society through a biblical lens, and that we would be faithful, faithful to stand for the truth, even as Micah testified against the world's deeds because they're evil, and as Jesus testified against the world's deeds because they're evil, that we would be the same, that we would be those that call a spade a spade, and that we would seek to point back to you and point back to the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I do pray for our government. I do pray for our our leaders and those in office, Lord, that they would rule in line with your word and that we would be able to live in quiet and peaceable lives here on earth. Lord, I pray that you would save our representatives um, from Joe Biden all the way down, that they would repent and believe upon you. Father, we know that you saved the king of Nineveh from the top down, you transform the society, and we know that you certainly can do that today. Father, we pray that your will be done most of all, and we trust in you as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Lord willing, next week we'll have a guest speaker. So, uh, Eric Weathers and Debbie Weathers, they will be out from the Masters Academy International. Very excited about that. I think you should be very excited about it too. During the Sunday school hour, I encourage you all to come because Eric's going to be giving a behind the scenes uh, picture and view toward what God has been doing through TMAI. Now, about three or four months ago, Allie and I went to a TMAI conference in Dallas and he went through this presentation there. And it's awesome. So like, I've seen it before, so I can say that. Like, it's really great. And I encourage you to come out. I think sometimes, I think it's easy when we have like a missionary family here for people to get a picture of who they are in their ministry. It's a little bit harder with an organization to get a feel for who they are and what's going on. And so I think this presentation will be really helpful to give you a taste of that and just very tangible ways that you can join in interceding for the ministry and what God is doing with TMAI. So that'll be Lord willing next week during the Sunday school hour. The following week, we're gonna do probably a two or three part study in 2 Kings uh, on King Manasseh. And if you're familiar with King Manasseh, you either remember him as the worst king in all of uh, Judah's history, which it wouldn't be wrong, or you remember him for his repentance uh, toward the end of his ministry. We're going to look at him for a few weeks. He's a very interesting individual, and uh, I think there's a lot that we can learn from him, but um, that'll be in a, yeah, a couple of weeks. But uh, if you'd like to grab water or coffee or something else, now's a great time to do that. Uh, You are dismissed. We'll reconvene in about 12 minutes.